Welcome everybody, this is Annika Tonerud, founder of Act to Exceed. Today I am talking to a person I have been waiting a long time to talk to. Dr. Ivan Meissner, welcome. Thank you, Annika, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. So mm -hmm. if anyone doesn't already know you, I am going to read a little introduction. Um, so. Ivan is the founder of BNI, which is Business Network International, the world's largest business networking organization. Founded in 1985, the organization now has over 7,700. Is that the up-to-date number? Uh, I get daily numbers, and as yeah. of this morning, we had 7,833 uh, chapters. All right, so 7,833. Yes. Yes. Okay. Chapters, which is like a group, right? That's correct. Okay. So many groups throughout every populated continent of the world. And last year alone, BNI generated over 7.7 .7 million referrals, resulting in more than $9.3 billion of business for its members. That is amazing. Thank you. Yeah, and so and you're a New York Times bestselling author and have written and co-written 21 books, unless you've just finished another one now. No, that's the, that's the current number. Yeah. yeah, working on any more books? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Usually we're going to two or three at a time. Okay. Uh, wow. All right. You've been called the father of modern networking by CNN and one of the top networking experts by Forbes. Uh, considered to be one of the world's leading experts on business networking and has been a keynote speaker for major corporations and associations throughout the world. You have received many awards and two of the ones that I like the most is Humanitarian of the Year from the Red Cross and also I personally had the honor to watch you live on stage in Orlando, Florida in August when you received the um, John Maxwell Leadership Award. It was wonderful to watch you live on stage and to see, to hear you say that it was really tough to be in the selection procedure because it was not just like, here you are, here's your award. Yeah. So yeah, thank very, you. Very true. Yeah. Um, you and your wife of 27 years, is that, I was going to say, is that even possible in today's <laughs> society? But yeah. It is, yes. Yeah. Hat off to that. Thank you. Congratulations. So Elizabeth, right, and you have written a book together called The Meissner Plan, yes. where you talk about how you healed from cancer by using natural remedies and living a healthy lifestyle. Yes. And in my little introduction, last but not least, um, this is awesome. In your spare time, and I have no clue when that is, but in your spare time, you're a magician. And you have a black belt in karate. I do, and uh, yes, and uh, the operative word with the magician is amateur magician. Uh, definitely an amateur magician. No, I, I decided to scrap that. My children are amateur magicians, and anything above that, I consider magician. So, okay. so um, I have uh, probably a billion questions, but let's go through a few of them. Uh, I've heard you talk about social capital, as yeah. in social relations that have productive benefits, right? Yes. So what is someone who wants to grow their social capital? What should they be doing? Well, you know, I, I view social capital actually somewhat similarly to financial capital. You, 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 um, the bank doesn't like it when you write a check for more money than you have in the bank. And social capital is about investing in relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I have to invest in a relationship before I try to take out a withdrawal. What happens in networking is that people use networking as a face-to-face -face cold calling opportunity. Hi, my name is Ivan. Let's do business. I've got a great product for you. I've got a great service for you. Let me see. buy my product, buy my service. And they're asking, or, or worse yet for me, would you refer me to, you've met John Maxwell, would you refer me to him? Like, I'm sorry, what was your name? I don't even know you. You know, People introduce themselves to me and they want referrals mm -hmm. and I don't even know them. When you give a referral, you give a little bit of your reputation away. 
if you give a good referral, it enhances your reputation. But if you give a bad referral, it hurts your reputation. And so I tell people that networking is about building social capital. When people know you, like you, and trust you, they're going to do business with you and they're going to refer you. But all of that takes time. And if you're not willing to take the time necessary to invest in the relationship, then you're never going to be successful at networking. Mm -hmm. now, let, me, let me tell you one, one other quick story. I did a speech in London a few years back, and there were about 1,000 people there. And uh, I was the keynote speaker, and I asked the audience, so how many of you are here today hoping to, you know, maybe just possibly sell something? 1,000 people raised their hands. I was like, okay, great. Mm. Second question, how many of you are here today hoping to just possibly, you know, maybe um, buy something? No one raised their hands. Not one single person. And again, this is what I call the networking disconnect. People show up wanting to sell, but nobody's there to buy. Mm. And so if you're going to use networking in that way, then uh, it's only going to be a face-to-face -face cold calling opportunity. Instead, you have to use networking to build relationships with people. And if you do that, then you're doing the process correctly. First of all, I have to say, I love the thing about the bank. Yeah. I've heard people many times talk about what networking is and how you should do it. But that one, I really like that one. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you. You also say that networking is a contact sport. And when the first time I read that, I was like, yes, I love it. So why can we not stay at home and build an awesome website, send offers and promote some fancy stuff on Facebook and social media? What does not that work? Well, look, I'm, I'm a fan of social media. I'm very active on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. So I'm not, I have no problems with social media. Um, I also believe that it's not a case of either or. It's either social media or face-to-face. -face. I believe it's both and. That you need to have that face-to-face -face networking and that social media is a great way of staying connected and having touch points. You know, we, we met at the, the John Maxwell uh, event. Uh, something like this is a great way to stay connected. Technology today is so amazing. You know, when I went to school, I, I couldn't keep, the only way I could keep connected to people that I went to, particularly university with, um, was to send a letter or, or make a phone call, set an appointment, get, have a phone call. Today, you can stay connected to people so easily. But nothing beats that face-to-face -face element. Nothing. I um, did an interview in uh, Stockholm, Sweden a few years ago, and, and this young 20-something-year-old kid came to do the interview, and it took him several hours to get to me because of traffic. And it was really funny because he spent the first two or three minutes of the interview. This is, uh, this is, this is true. It's not a joke. First two or three minutes of the interview, he said to me, he, he was saying to me, you, you have founded the buggy whip business of the networking industry. And I'm like, okay, what do you mean by that? He said, well, BNI is the buggy whip business of the networking industry with technology today. Um, you don't need to get face to face. And it's just the same like with the horse and carriage when where horse and carriage was replaced by the automobile, the buggy whip business went out of business. And so this face to face thing is gonna go away. Right. And, I, and I said, okay, so why are you here? And he said, what do you mean, why am I here? What do you mean, why are you here doing the interview? He said, well, my boss said I had to do the interview. I said, I get it that you're not particularly impressed with the topic, but why are you here? It took you two hours to get here. It's going to take you longer to get back with traffic. Why are you here? And I swear to you, Annika, without even, without even blinking, he said, oh, well, because a face-to-face -face interview is always better. And I just, I kind of looked at it and we were like this, and he's like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. Now, this happened, by the way, he said we were the buggy with business of the networking industry. This happened in 2009. That was seven years ago. And uh, BNI has grown by probably 1,500 chapters in the last seven years, maybe 2,000 chapters. So, um, you know, face-to-face -face networking is so important. Nothing beats 
meeting someone, looking them in the eye, shaking their hands and having a conversation. I'm a real believer in face-to-face -face networking. BNI has 7,833 meetings a week. How many? We have 7,833 chapters. Yeah. Every chapter meets every week all around the world. So every week, BNI has 7,833 face-to-face meetings worldwide. We actually meet seven days a week, um, the, the various chapters, because uh, you have to remember, not all chapters practice the same religions and not all countries. And so uh, weekends for many people in North America are not necessarily the same for others in Asia or in, or in, in mid the Middle East. And so we have cha chapters that meet worldwide 365 days a year. I mean, they don't meet every day, but there is a chapter meeting somewhere in the world 365 days a year. That's cool. It is kind of cool. But is, so when you can when you commit to a BNI chapter, you're supposed to come to every meeting, right? So what happens to the, let's say, typical business person who has quite a bit of traveling? Is that yeah. excused? There is an attendance requirement, uh, but y y you can miss meetings. There's a certain number of meetings that you can miss. You can also send a substitute who represents you. So if you're unable to make a meeting, you can send somebody who represents you. Uh, but, uh, you know, have you ever gotten a haircut over the phone? It's no. It's hard to do, right? You got to be there. One of the things that we've learned in networking is that if you're present, it, it makes a world of difference. Uh, and I'll tell you how we first discovered it. it was completely by accident. When I started BNI 32 years ago, um, I didn't know any better. And I was, I was creating an industry. I didn't know what worked or didn't work. And so I had some people say to me, every week is too much. Can we meet twice a month? And I said, yes. And so those chapters that met twice a month instead of every week, uh, over a course of about a year, we discovered that they passed 52% less referrals. 52% less referrals. And I went to them and I said, if I, if I could give you one suggestion um, that would double the number of referrals, you had to have twice, twice as many referrals, would you do it? And they said, yeah, of course. I said, change from twice a month to every, every week. And there were only seven groups at the time. We only had 23 groups at the time. Um, and, and seven of them met uh, twice a month. Six of the seven made the change and they doubled the number of referrals they were passing. The seventh ended up closing down because they weren't passing enough referrals. So we found that being present really makes a, a big difference. There is an attendance requirement, but you, you, you don't have to make every single meeting. Mm. Okay, the haircut. <laughs> over the phone, it's hard to do, yeah. isn't it? That it's really hard to do over the phone. <laughs> All right, uh, Ivan, giver's gain is what you say within the BNI. Uh, can you explain what this represents and why you believe it is so? Yeah. So giver's gain is one of the core values. I think it's the principal core value for BNI. And when I started the organization, um, be before I started BNI, I went to networking groups. And, and, I, and I saw two types of networking groups that I just felt we're missing something. Most networking groups, to me personally, I felt we're missing something. There were those who were very mercenary mm -hmm. and it was all about business. They were very transactional. And it was all about what can you give me, you know, not, not how can I help you, but what can you give me? And if you, you know, I'd see people, they'd meet someone and they felt like if you didn't have something to offer, it's like, you know, you're not good enough. And they would go to someone else. Clearly, I felt uncomfortable with that kind of network. They're very transactional, mercenary. On the other hand, I went to networks who were very social. It's like, eh, let's have another glass of wine. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Oh, you know, and they just they weren't focused. There was no organization, no structure. I I believe I believe you have to have rules. You know, I, and and I, sometimes people say. Oh, you know, we're B&I without the rules. I love those groups. Competitors. I love competitors who say we're B&I without the rules because they fail. You know, hot hockey without rules 
would be boxing on ice. Yeah. <laughs> you got to have rules. And if you want to have uh, some success in business, there has to be rules. So what you need is this combination of, of wanting to help, but having structure. And what I did was I created this organization that had both, but with the core value of Giver's Game. That if you want to get business, if you want that transaction to take place, you've got to be willing to give business. You've got to be willing to help other people. And if you're not willing to help help other people, this isn't for you. You know, God bless you. We love you. You're wonderful. This isn't for you. you this is about the, this is about the sum of the whole being greater than the individual parts. That by everyone working together, you can achieve more. Yeah. And um, you know, every once in a while, I come up with a good idea that works really well. And I, I, that was really, I think, integral to the success of the organization. Um, yeah. How, how did you win or how did you get the idea to start BNI? Well, I'd like to tell you I had this vision of yeah. a, an international organization. I, I think BNI is a great example of necessity being the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. I needed referrals for my consulting business. I was a management consultant. Mm -hmm. I worked with companies in hiring employees and strategic planning. Um, I put together a small group of people that I trusted and they trusted me. And um, I wanted to create a network that, that had structure, but was also not mercenary. And so I just created a group for my friends and myself. Would so, like a little bit like a mastermind. Yeah, except, except we weren't there to, to share knowledge. Mm -hmm. Although that happens, we were there to share business. So the purpose was not, a, it was not a mastermind group. It was a referral group. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, mastermind groups, people will pass referrals. Well, referral groups, people were mastermind. I mean, it happens. But yeah. our, our, our primary mission was to pass referrals. And uh, we met, and from the very beginning, we only took one person per profession. So one lawyer, one banker, one chiropractor. And um, someone came in the first couple of months who couldn't join and she asked if I would help her open up a second group. And I actually I actually said, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't do this. I'm a, I'm a business consultant. And she said, well, this is kind of consulting. You're helping me build my business. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's a stretch, but uh, all right, we'll do, I'll, I'll do a second one. At this first meeting in the second chapter, we had about 25 people come. Two couldn't join because of a conflict with the other professions. They, they rep, that profession was represented. And both of them said, this is great. I could get a ton of business out of this. Would you help me bring my own? Would you help me start my own group? And I said, no, this isn't what I do. I'm a business consultant. They made the same argument. Um, and we opened up and we were off to the races. We ended up opening 20 chapters um, mm -hmm. that year. 20 chapters. So, and, so, yeah. yeah. The 20 chapters, and um, it was at the end of the year, as a matter of fact, it was, you know, between Christmas and New Year's, real close to where we are now, that I, I, every year between Christmas and New Year, I, I take a few days off and I reflect, you know, I, I look to the future. Where, what do I want to do next year? Where do I want to be in five years? How, how, did, how did last year play out to my plan? And that year between Christmas and New Year's, I, I thought, what the heck just happened? This was not part of my plan at all. And it was at that point I realized I had struck a chord in the business community, mm. that people need referrals. They just don't know how to get them. And we don't teach this in colleges and universities anywhere in the world. We don't teach networking, we don't teach referral marketing. And uh, right. that's when I really kind of got the vision uh, that this could be something global. So you actually mm. had the situation that every startup person dreams of. You sit at home and you have this, you just want to work and wish someone would come and ask for your thing. Yeah. What happened to you. I did. I did. And, but I stumbled into it. You know, um, I, I understood the concept of push marketing and pull marketing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the idea of push marketing is you, you're working hard to push this business through. And then with pull marketing, you are pulled through the process. Mm -hmm. And um, I, being a business consultant, I loved it. It was interesting work, but you had to push. You had to go out and get business. Mm -hmm. 
And as soon as you stop getting business, your business dried up. And I realized at the end of that year, I literally thought of this idea of I am being pulled through the marketplace. I didn't, I didn't try to open 20 chapters. Yeah. And yet I opened 20 chapters. And it was that realization that made me stop and think, wait a minute, wait a minute. You need to stop and really look at this, this program closer because you're being pulled through the marketplace. That means there's a real need that you didn't realize before. And, and that's why I say, I'd like to tell you I had this vision, but I didn't, I stumbled into it. What I did do was I recognized the vision. It took me close to a year, but I recognized the vision and then created a plan and a strategy to implement that vision uh, over the course of the next couple of decades. I love to hear that people actually can stumble and be pulled through the whole process and, and then make something fantastic with it. Yeah. Um, earlier this year, a coach said to me, Annika, don't waste your time on networking. It's just a bunch of people trying to sell their sh sugar. Um, so let's say that at a typical networking event, I'm talking non-BNI, yeah. uh, you go in and you always meet the person that almost instantly tries to sell. Yeah. and which is, I for me, I always feel it's uncomfortable and I get, I get put off. Uh, how can you turn a situation like that into something positive? Well, look, if, if you meet someone who, um, okay, I believe that networking is more about farming than it is about hunting. Mm. That it's about cultivating relationships with other people. And when I meet someone at a networking event who is clearly a hunter, Mm -hmm. uh, I end the conversation politely, uh, but I end the conversation as soon as possible and uh, continue to um, meet people looking for someone new who is a farmer, who wants to cultivate relationships. And um, look, if, if you don't, I, I love this, you know, networking, when people say networking doesn't work, come on, let's think about this for a second. How else are you going to build your business? What are all the ways? you can build your business where you can advertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have spoken to, to hundreds of thousands of people, people in the last 32 years. And many, many of my presentations, I'll talk about the different ways that you can market. And in the thousands and thousands of people that I've talked to, I've said, how many of you um, have gotten all the business? Raise your hand. I'll say this to audiences. How many of you have gotten all the business you need from the advertising that you've done. And in all the years I've asked that question, not one hand has ever been raised. Not one. So I'm a believer in advertising, but everyone I have ever talked to has said, I need to do more. Ad advertising is one way to build my business, but I need to do more. Well, okay, great, what else? Well, there's direct sales, there's cold calling, you know, you can cold call, you can do direct selling, you can do PR. What else? There's not much else. I don't know about you, but networking is so much more effective. Referrals, first of all, referrals, studies have shown that you are uh, uh, substantially more likely to get a to get business off of a referral than a cold call or an advertisement. Yeah. And the last number I saw was 15 times more likely to have a sale from a referral than a cold call or or than a uh, uh, ad. Okay, so somebody who calls you off of an advertisement is not nearly as likely as someone who calls you off of a referral. Um, so referrals are so effective, but the only way you can get those are by building relationships. And the only way to build, effectively build relationships is through networking. And so when I say people use networking as a cold calling opportunity, that's when networking is done wrong. Yeah. Okay. So you want to know how to do networking, right? Let me give you what, what I call the, the it's, it's called the VCP process. It's, the three steps to building a solid set of relationships. I call it the VCP process. It stands for visibility, credibility, profitability. It's a chronological process. It begins with visibility. 
you first have to be visible in the community. People have to know who you are and what you do. Then and only then can you establish credibility where people know who you are, they know what you do, and they know you're good at it. Mm -hmm. And then and only then can you move to profitability where people know who you are, they know what you do, they know you're good at it, and they're willing to pass you referrals on an ongoing reciprocal basis. What tends to happen is that people try to go straight from visibility right to profitability. Hi, my name's uh, Ivan Annika, let's do business. And they try to jump over credibility and they jump over that relationship building process and, and go right to business. I did a book, uh, I don't know if you know about this book, I did a book called Business Networking and Sex. Yeah, I read about it. I didn't okay. read it, but I read about it. And, and the subtitle is Not What You Think. It's about Not the difference think, between right. men and women and how they network. And we have, we have an expression in there that we, on networking, it's called premature solicitation, which you don't want to say fast three times, it'll get you in trouble. But uh, it's, <laughs> you know, we, we use that where, where people try to jump over visibility and jump right to profitability. Uh, and that ne almost never works. And so you're right, people do say networking doesn't work, but that's because they're doing it all wrong. Yeah. That's not networking, that's direct selling to me. Networking is about building relationships. And so if you follow the VCP process, which is all about building relationships, then networking can be highly, highly effective. V plus C equals P. Well, it's not a formula. So it's not a formula, it's a process. So actually V plus C could equal, could uh, you know, it's not like one plus two equals three. One plus two could equal 20. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but profitability can be a billion. So. Yes. So I, I don't, I like to call it a process rather than a formula because mm -hmm. it, 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 if, if you do it right, the, the result can be a multiple. It could yeah. be more than one times or, or, you know, it could be more than one plus uh, two equals three. It could be way more. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's definitely a process. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you just answered uh, my next question there. Um, what do we have here? I'm, I'm so, this is so nice to listen to. I forget what I'm going to ask. I have to check. <laughs> uh, okay, so if you meet someone for the first time yeah. and, and not in a private, in someone's home to like family meeting, but in outside the world business-ish, yeah. What are three things, like really nice questions you ask to break the ice? Yeah, first of all, I think it's important to remember that a good networker has two ears and one mouth <clears throat> and should use them both proportionately. So you should listen. A really good networker is somebody who learns how to listen. And, um, and it's really funny because people often think that extroverts make the best networkers. And I would argue that they don't necessarily they don't necessarily make their best network because they, they have to teach themselves to listen more effectively. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, the favorite subject of an extrovert is themselves. <laughs> you know, they love to talk about themselves. So mm. that's not necessarily good in a networker. So extroverts have to learn how to listen. Introverts are already pretty good at listening. And so that's the skill that you want to do. So when you meet somebody, you do want to ask them some questions. I've written several books where I have a whole list of questions. Uh, one of the books I wrote uh, that lists all my questions is a book called The 29% Solution, uh, 52 Weekly Networking Success Strategies. And so in that book, um, I have a whole list of questions to ask, but th there's, there's, it's not rocket science. It's, you know, try it. A good networker is like a good interviewer, okay? You have, you have asked me questions in areas that you know I have interest in, and you've let me expand. And so as you meet people, when you ask them a question, you find the area that they're interested in and you let them expand. A good interview lets someone open up and talk about their subject. Then what you want to do is follow that. So as you're asking questions, remember it's not an interrogation, it's a discussion. And so follow the line of the discussion, ask them more. So uh, a great question to start off with is, 
I like to see what business they're in on their name tag. And so I'll ask them, what do you love most about being a banker or whatever business that the person is in? If, I, if they're not wearing a name tag that says it, I'll say, so t tell me what you do, just to know what it is. And then, then I'll say, what do you love most about it? What are some of the biggest challenges that, that, uh, that you have in that right now? Or how's the marketplace affecting that right now? And just get them to open up and talk. Uh, one of the last questions I ask actually is, what are some of the challenges you have in your business? You, you want to do that last after they've opened up a lot. And you'll be amazed at how many times they'll tell you a challenge that you can actually help them with. Not by selling them something, but by they'll tell you they've got this problem and, and then you say, you know, I know somebody that works with those issues that can help you in that area. If you'd like, I'd be happy to introduce you. To me, when I'm meeting people, I want to find overlapping areas of interest where I can be a connector, where I can connect one person who has a need with somebody who can help that, help that individual. And if I can do that effectively, then I'm starting to invest in the social capital. Mm -hmm. I've now helped that person. I'll give you a real quick example. <clears throat> I was at, a, was at a church event, actually, years ago. And, you know, people say, you can't network at church events. Yes, you can. I believe you can network anywhere. But you have to understand you must always honor the event. Okay, always honor the event. So, you know, you don't go to a church event and, you know, pass out your business cards, right? That, that, that's not honoring the event. Honoring the event, though, is having conversations with people is to honor the event. And so I met somebody who I'd been wanting to get to know. He was a very successful businessman. And I asked him questions about his business. And he opened up and he was really interested and excited about, you know, what he does. And the last question I asked him is, so, you know, it sounds like this is doing great. What are some of the challenges you have? And he said to me, you know, the biggest challenge I've got, Ivan, is I really give, believe in giving back to the community. But I'm not, my company isn't big enough to have its own charitable foundation. But we're too big to not be contributing to the communities. And sometimes we have a great year financially and sometimes it's not quite as strong, but I, you know, I have no way of building up money for those ups and downs. Mm. And I said, wow, have you ever heard of a community foundation? And he said, no, what are those? I said, well, you can create a fund where you don't, you don't open your own foundation, but you have a fund underneath a parent foundation. And on great years, you could put in a ton of money. On leaner years, you don't have to put in that much. And you don't have to spend it every year. You don't have to give it away every year. You give it away over time. And he said, oh, my goodness, that's exactly what I've been looking for. Do you know anyone? And I said, yeah, I know, I know a great guy. I, I have a community fund at a foundation. Uh, I've worked with him for 10 years. I'd be happy to introduce you. He gives me his business card at this church event, and he said, would you please have him call me? And, of course, I did, and he ended up opening a fund. Now, here's my question, Annika. If I called this man a week or two later and I said, I'd love to meet you for lunch and talk more about your business, would he, would he take my call? Yes. And, and would he meet with me? Oh, yes, he would, he yeah. would invite you for lunch. Yeah, absolutely. He'd probably buy my lunch. Yeah. Now, see the difference between that to me is networking. Mm -hmm. Networking isn't, hey, do business with me or refer me. Networking is finding opportunities to build a relationship. And the best way to build a relationship is to help someone. And everyone's needs are different. His were a lot different than many of the people I meet. But if you can find some way to help them, you then begin to build a relationship. Mm. So if you sum up the whole BNI uh, giver's gain, you must truly detach from wanting a result and go in and knowing that if I go in here and network, I'm a, a nice person and build my social capital, <clears throat> good things are going to come of it. Yes, and... It's also important to uh, understand that you are there to get business. And so at the same time that you go into this with an open mind to help people, you also want to remember that it's, it's your obligation to teach people mm -hmm. how to refer you. Yeah. 
So you can't just go in with this Pollyanna attitude that I'm just going to help everybody. You know, I'm going to be Mother Teresa and just help help everyone. Um, you have to go in wanting to help, but also knowing how to teach people to refer you. So it's both of those things combined. And so a large part of what I do, certainly in BNI or, or outside BNI, <clears throat> is teach people how to ask for referrals, how to get people to refer you. And what I tell them is, is often very um, counterintuitive. Um, when people ask for referrals, first of all, they ask too soon. Mm-hmm. They, you know the expression, it never hurts to ask? Yeah. Completely wrong. It absolutely hurts to ask. If you if you ask too early in the relationship, they're never going to want to talk to you again. Mm-hmm. Like the person who says, "Hi, you know, Annika, my name is so and so. Would you refer me?" Um, so y- you can ask too soon, and um, so you have to build the relationship first. But then you have to teach people how to refer you. So let's say you've built a relationship. You and I have a, a professional relationship. It's now incumbent on me to teach you how you can refer me. Mm-hmm. And what we tend to do in networking environments is we try to, to tell people everything we do. I'm a full service whatever. I, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. I, whatever you need in this area, I can do it all. And that never works. It's too much. You're giving people all this information and they don't know where to go with it. Instead, and this is the counterintuitive part, you have to be laser specific about what you do. And as you're meeting people over time, you give them a little piece of what you do. And it's one of the reasons why B and I work so well is every week we t- teach people, tell them a little part of your business. Go as deep as you can in the time you have to tell them this piece. And then next week, tell them this piece. And then the week after that, tell them this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece. So that over time, people have a really good vision of what you do. And you've been specific enough with them that when they hear something, they go, I know somebody that can help you with that. Because you've told a story about this very small element of your business. So what we tend to do is shotgun our presentation instead of sharpshoot it. Mm-hmm. We have to sharpshoot it. And that's completely counterintuitive because people want to say everything they do when they meet somebody. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great stuff. Um, Ivan, you've had some health issues and challenges you had to overcome. Having been through that, has anything changed in the way you lead your life, how you make priorities, or how you invest your time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the book that my wife and I did. Uh, and, and yes, my wife and I have been married 27 years. I met her in BNI. Uh-huh. Uh, we met her, it was the best referral I ever got. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she was a BNI um, a chapter president. Uh, I met her. Um, so, yeah, I, look, I was one of those guys that um, I didn't eat particularly well. I didn't eat a lot of fast food, but I'll tell you what I ate was a lot of uh, processed foods, mm. a lot of packaged, a lot of packaged foods. And a lot of um, sugar. You know, I loved ice cream. Uh, you know, I had no problem with cake or pies, and um, and so I ate a lot of processed food, a lot of sugar. And um, five, almost five years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, mm-hmm. and I was told by the doctor, "You have you have six months to make a decision uh, on what kind of surgery uh, you're going to have, uh, but you, you need to have surgery, and there are many different kinds of surgeries that you can get, and, and you need to pick." But you got six months to do it. And so luckily I didn't have, you know, it wasn't advanced where, you know, you need to go in tomorrow. Um, So I had a little bit of time. And my wife has always been a little bit more of a health fanatic than I was. Mm -hmm. And so she said, look, she said, come to my doctor down in, it was in San Diego, Center for Advanced Medicine. And let's look at some um, ways of changing your diet and, and you a, you know, f- focusing on the the, the, the the root cause. And I thought, oh, please, you know, that's not going to fix this. But you know what? What do I have to lose? I'll be in a healthier place for when I have to go do surgery. Yeah. That was, I, I had nothing to lose. Might as well get into a healthier place. So over the next 
four months, I lost 45 pounds by just changing my diet. I was never hungry. I ate all the time, but I, but I ate no processed foods whatsoever. I cut out all sugar, uh, I cut out the foods that are cancer causing or cancer that feed cancer. I don't want to say cancer causing, but that feed cancer. Yeah. And so I lost all kinds of weight, which was amazing. And I was in a healthier place, but then something funny started to happen. My, my markers for cancer started to drop. Mm -hmm. And at the end of six months, my, my doctor said, what are you doing? And I told him, and he's like, yeah, it can't be that. What, what else are you doing? That's it. And so uh, over the next three months, he would check me every month. And at, at nine months, he said, you're in remission. I don't need to see you for a year. And it's now been five <laughs> years. Um, and, and I changed it all through, through diet and nutrition. I have never gone into, I've never done radiation uh, traditional chemotherapy or, uh, or, or surgery. Um, the book is called The Meisner Plan, but Beth and I are working on another book that should be out in just a few months called, uh, the working title is Heal, Heal Yourself Before You Harm Yourself. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's going to have recipes. Lots nice. and lots of recipes. And, and, and here's, here's the one message I want to give to people. I was such a non-believer that food would really make a difference in your health. And I could not, been, I could not have been more wrong. Um, yeah. It makes a huge, huge difference in your, in your health. And, um, and I think I'm living proof of that. Yeah. Yes, well done. Thank Sugar you. is not good for you, ever. Well, it, for a moment, when you have that, mm, but then... That's yeah, it. well, look, there are things that you can do, certain kinds of, okay. So if you have active cancer, you want to try and stay away from almost all foods that even have sugar, uh, like fruit even. But yeah. <clears throat> once you're in a healthy place, natural sugars are good in limited quantity. Honey uh, is actually very, very healthy in reasonable quantities. Uh, even mm -hmm. agave, which has some issues, can be uh, healthy for you. Um, uh, but sugars, you know, through fruit, oranges and, 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 and uh, watermelon, actually watermelon can be very, very good for the kind of cancer that I had because it has certain um, uh, elements that are anti-cancer or cancer fighting. So oh, ly lycopenes or something yeah, like lycopene. that? That's it, yeah. yes, it, it is the lycopene. Now, yeah. I, there are other things that have lycopene like tomatoes, but tomatoes are an inflammatory, which mm -hmm. if you have some active cancer issues, you actually want to stay away from things that are inflammatory. So tomatoes sometimes are not, and it really depends on the condition you have. It's not one size fits all. So you have to understand the condition you have and what this uh, vegetable or fruit uh, does for you. So sugar in its non-processed form can be good, but in its processed form is almost never good. So they should put how to network, like how to build your social capital and how to eat your, to be healthy on the school agenda and take away I would you know, agree with that. mathematics or something. Well, I don't think you have to take away anything, but I think you can, I think, I think adding some things in and uh, but listen, our school systems, our educational systems are a mess in many ways. Um, I, I think we don't, we don't teach networking. I don't think we will teach networking in my lifetime at most universities. And, and the don't say that. What's that? Don't say oh, that. It's not going to happen. I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was an adjunct faculty member at a state university for 16 years. For the last nine years, I've been on the board of trustees for a private university. I have seen universities from both ends of the spectrum, mm -hmm. from an adjunct faculty member, which is you know the sort of a, a part-time faculty, to a, a board of trustee where the president reports to the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've seen it from both ends. Full-time tenured professors control the curriculum at all universities other than maybe a private for-profit university. Other than those, the full-time tenured professors control the curriculum. So here's the deal. 
Most full-time tenured professors in business have never had a real job in their life. Yeah. They teach business, but they've never run a major business. So they teach what I call sterile marketing. Heaven forbid that I should get my hands dirty and make a sale. When have you seen a, a bachelor's degree in sales at a university? I, I can only think of one or two universities in the US who have a bachelor's degree in sales. Mm -hmm. Now marketing, but marketing is, is, you know, it's mostly advertising and social media. You don't have to get your hands dirty and make a sale. They don't teach sales in universities. So what happens is you give a, a kid a bachelor's degree in business and they get a job working for some company in a sales position and they, they have to send them to a Brian Tracy or Tommy Hopkins sales seminar because they weren't taught in school. So if we don't teach sales in business schools, networking is a long ways off. So if I can get in at a university here in Europe and invite you as a lecturer, will you come and <laughs> make help me make it happen so I can say I, I would definitely I would definitely come via a Skype call. All um, right. And, and and I you know I have taught uh, as an adjunct. I, I was able to talk at the university into um, teaching uh, networking, uh, but it was only for a couple of quarters, and it was a very specific kind of a reason. Um, so I have a syllabus. I'd be happy to share the syllabus with uh, someone. Um, by the way, one of the few universities, I think it's a university, it's a university in London, mm -hmm. uh, is only one of two universities in the world that have a core curriculum course on networking. One is in London and the other is the University of Michigan. That's it, two out of thousands. So there's room for growth. Yeah, I just don't think it's going to happen anytime soon uh, around the world. Okay. Which is okay, because I'm out there teaching it. Exactly. Makes more business for you. So uh, if we all had to go back 10 years and relive that decade, uh, is there anything you would have liked to have done differently? Yeah, you know, as, as I get more and more gray hair, people ask me uh, that question. Um, I, there are always things that, uh, one might do differently, but I don't believe in regret. Mm -hmm. Um, I think regret only takes place when you don't follow your core values. That if you have a set of core values that are, that are your, uh, weather vein that tell you how you should behave in life. Um, it's when you don't follow those. When you, when you say to yourself, I know I shouldn't do this, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do it anyway. You often do it because you may, it may be walking an ethical line, but there's a lot of money into it, and, and you do it, and, and you, you break one of your own core values, then you regret. Then it, I think you're likely to have regret. Mm -hmm. But if you stay true to your core values, and I have always tried to stay true to my core values. You have no, re you should have no regret. So my answer to your question is, I would do nothing different uh, 10 years ago because I did everything I did, I did with the knowledge and information I had at the time. And so knowing what I knew then, I would do what I did then. Yeah. Knowing what I know now, I might do many things differently. Mm -hmm. But knowing what I knew then, you know, you can't go back in time. And so I never, I never really dwell on, oh, I wish I hadn't done that mm -hmm. because I don't see any value in it. Good. I am very curious to hear how it is possible that an international networking guru has cards up his sleeve and is a magician. Was it a childhood dream or how did that happen? So I, I was a member of the uh, Magic Castle, the Academy of Magical Arts, for uh, oh, about 17 years. Uh, but I was an amateur member. I mean, I was a full full member, but uh, I never did magic shows professionally. I got into magic. I enjoyed it as a kid. And one day, um, I, have, I have three children. They're all grown now. 
But my oldest was probably five years old. And I was at some toy store and I saw a couple of magic tricks and I picked up, a, I picked up maybe five or six cheap little toy magic tricks. And I came home and I, I studied and, you know, I practiced and, and I did these five tricks for my daughter. And she's like, Ooh, daddy, that's awesome. Do it. Show me another one. And I showed her all five of them. And she said, show me another one. And I'm like, I don't have any more. She's like, Oh, <laughs> so I drove, I swear to you, I drove back to the store and I bought every magic trick that the store had. <laughs> and I did all of these, learned them overnight. And the next day I did another, you know, eight or 10 magic tricks. And, and <clears throat> I found out that close to my house was a professional magic store. Oh. that sold professional grade magic tricks. And so they were crazy expensive. So I couldn't buy a whole lot at one time, but I'd go in every couple of weeks and I'd buy one brand new magic trick professional. I ended up getting an amazing collection of magic, professional magic, and did it for years and years, but just for my kids. I do it at kids' parties, but their parties. I never did magic outside of that. Wow. wow. So I did it for my children. Yeah. I'm hanging I, on I, to a lot of the magic tricks because I'm hoping, you know, one of these days I'm going to have grandkids. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull out the magic tricks. Yeah. Here is the opposite. I also have three kids, but it's them who do the tricks, and I'm, oh, some are really, really good, and mm -hmm. I still don't know how to do them because we've made a pact that they will not tell me and I will not try and find out, so. Love it. Okay, what? How old, how old are your children? Uh, uh, eight, eight, and nine. And and which one are, are they all into magic or just one of them? Uh, they're like all three, but the nine-year-old is super into it. He, the twin boy is number two, and the twin girl is also, yeah. but not so much. Well, there's there's some fantastic books on yeah. magic, and some are written by young people mm -hmm. and uh you know if you can get them if you give them a book that's too complicated on magic it will just stress yeah. them yeah but if you give them a simple book on magic then it just kind of lights that fire and gets them more and more and more interested you just gave me that thing i was looking for to add as santa claus uh there you go simple book on magic good thank you so much for that yeah, one my pleasure all right, so um, uh, three more questions here. Uh, ha, la, la, what two books two, have made a big difference in your life or made an impact? Books that you are very happy to recommend. Uh, absolutely, positively, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. The mm -hmm. E-Myth stands for the Entrepreneurial Myth. Uh -huh. um, and um, I read that book and I based um, the building of my company on many of the concepts that are in that book. For example, he, you know, he talks about working on your business, not just in your business, learn how to work on your business. He talks about um, creating um, manuals and systems and structures as though you're gonna franchise your business, even if you don't plan on franchising your business. I did all of these things. And uh, 20 years later, I had a chance to meet and get to know Michael uh, and he and I are now very good friends. Uh, I know him really well. Uh, and to think that I, when I read that book that someday I would be friends with him is just amazing to me. Uh, but fantastic material, the E-Myth, I highly recommend it. Uh, the second book would be a book, uh, it, it's a book called um, uh, Crucial Conversation. Mm -hmm. Crucial conversations. There are four authors to the book. I don't remember all of their names, but it's called Crucial Conversations, and it's about um, conversations when the when the stakes are high, and when you're dealing with conflict. and And those are kind of bookend books for me. One book was really critical in the beginning of my career, and one book was really critical in the mature element of my career. When I had many, many people, there are now 4,000, almost 5,000 people who work for BNI. So almost 5,000 people. And mm -hmm. so when you have a lot of people, you get a lot of potential conflict. 
And Crucial Conversations is a great book to help learn how to deal effectively with different, uh, to have, how to communicate effectively when times are stressful. Good. I'm going to get these two. Uh, Ivan, if you could share only one more blog, what would you write about? Um, if I could only do one more blog, what would I write about? That's a great question. Um, you know, I don't think I've ever written about the regret topic. You know, don't have any regrets. Follow your life values and, mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to worry about regrets. Um, I don't think I've ever written about that. I've talked about it, but I've, I've never, I've never written about that. I, I would write that blog. So you've just motivated me to write that blog. I should probably Good. do it. I'll, I'll try and do it before the first of the year. All right. I love it. Um, and if you have to select one of all the books you have written that we all will read, mm -hmm. which one do you feel like recommending? Well, it's like picking your favorite child. It's impossible to do, you know. Uh, this is my favorite. It would it would depend on you know the needs that the person has. Um, so I'm, I can't I can't do one. I'll give you two. All right. One would be about networking, and one mm. would be a, a more general business book. So if you mm. want the most comprehensive book I've written on networking, it would have to be the world's best known marketing secret. It's now in its fourth edition, and I've added to it over 20 years. So the world's best known marketing secret. Uh, and Masters of Success as a general business book. Um, and very little about networking in there, but it's, it's, about, it's about how to become successful in business and in life. And, mm -hmm. and you know there are many really core themes in there that I, I use today in, in teaching people how to build a successful business. Good. Good. I love when I get really good book recommendations. Good. You want, I'll give you one little nugget out of the book. Yeah. The secret to success without hard work is still mm -hmm. a secret. The secret to success without hard work is still a secret. It doesn't exist. If you want to be successful, you have to work hard. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for saying that. I've been told, no, Annika, you're doing it wrong. You're not supposed to work so hard, work less. Was that? How is that possible? Well, I think, uh, look, I tell people I'm a 20-year overnight success. Yeah. <laughs> it took me 20 years to, of hard, hard work to build a successful company. Uh, I just turned 60 this year. And I'll tell you, I work a lot less hard than I did 10, 10 years ago. I don't have yeah. to work as hard. I do the things I love the most now. Mm -hmm. I believe an entrepreneur is either working in their flame or working in their wax. When they're in their flame, they're on fire, they're excited, they love what they're doing. When they're in their wax, it just takes all their energy away. And so my goal for a long time was to work, you know, 100% of my time in my flame. And it, 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 you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get to do what you wanna do. So I had to do what I had to do to get to do where I'm at, where I'm at now. Mm. And um, people who tell you, uh, you know, I've got the secret or you don't have to work that hard, they're lying to you. They're lying to you. I think it takes hard work to build a successful business, but you can build it to a point where you can get a team of people in place who can help you carry it on and, and you can slow down a little bit more and smell the roses and enjoy life. And That's that is important. Yeah. Yeah. All right. My last question, Ivan. What yeah. are you looking forward to the most in 2017? Um, I, 2017 to me will be, I think, the very first year in my 32 years where I am working almost 100% of my flame. Um, you know, it's taken a long time to get here. And, and for many years, I would certainly for the last couple of years, it was probably 60, 70% in my flame, but 20 or 30%, you know, in that, in that wax. 
And this year looks to be the year where I'm going to be spending 95% of my time in my flame and 5% in my wax. There's always something you got to do that you don't like. Even the, even the founder of a company has got to do stuff that they don't necessarily like. But, um, but the, this is the first time where uh, I'm really going to be. And for me, my flame is, is this doing interviews, writing, speaking, talking to members, talking to the public. That's my flame. And, uh, you know, I plan on 2017 will be my, my flame year. I look forward to watching your fire and you know, your flames or both, all of it. Thank you. Uh, Ivan, it has been an honor and a real pleasure. I could have continued for hours and hours, but thank you for taking the time. And I wish you happy holidays and a healthy and happy flamey year. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, anytime. Bye. Bye.